I encourage especially you men that get together and you're praying. You can hear the heart of the Lord when I know y'all get together. Frankie prays. You can hear it. And CJ's up here. You can hear it. And Ryan Farrell doesn't say much, but you can hear it loud and clear in his faithfulness. Amen. And for you sisters, too, that uh, I'm convicted at times by you. Just continue on faithfulness and in, in, uh, in the battle. And we are, we are definitely, we are definitely in a battle. Amen. I believe there's been quite a battle even for what we're going to do this morning. A few things I want to say. I know that things are changing on the geopolitical level and all these levels and on spiritual levels. That's going to sound weird to people, but I don't want us to be distracted from what God is doing. Right? What I mean by that is the things that are going on in the Middle East and with Israel, we should, the church should have expected all this, knowing what's, what's coming. Yes? And we said a long time ago that things would swing this way, and then they'd begin to come back. But they wouldn't come all the way back. Remember we said that? That's what you're seeing right now. You're seeing things begin to swing. All of a sudden, people are waking up to, hey, maybe Hamas and these people are really evil. Because Satan, as Oswald Chambers said once, Satan hates it when righteousness breaks out because people see good and it convicts them. And he hates it when evil breaks out too much because it makes people think. And that's what's happening. People are thinking. So I'm not fooled by Hollywood and these politicians that are all saying, we stand with Israel. There's still a hatred for Israel in many of their hearts. But they've been shocked. In their humanity, not in their spirituality, because people are human. And I don't take that away from them, that they've been shocked in their humanity at the brutality of what's going on. Yeah. So things are swinging back. The trans thing and all, it's just got so insane that it's swinging back, but it's not coming all the way. And our job, and I believe this with all my heart, our job as believers is to stand here and say, this is the ground of Jesus Christ. Right. So things swing back. People live together in sin. People don't get married. That's an accepted fact. It doesn't even upset anybody more. Preachers would used to weep in the pulpit for that. Doesn't even bother. Things that are coming back. I read at least twice this week about preachers caught in sexual sins and these churches and stuff. And it is a shock. But like I said, 40, 50 years ago, the church would be shook to its core. Now it's just like oh, another one bites the dust. So things our job is to stand here and say. And I hope and pray you will see that this morning as we go into this. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yep. So I don't want you to, and I appreciated Frankie praying for Israel this morning. We should all be praying for the peace of Israel. Amen. Absolutely. But don't misunderstand where we're headed because what we're headed is we're holding this ground because things are going to begin to come back, but they're not coming back to the, to the Lord completely. They just swing back. Amen. And uh, the other things I'd like to say address us as a church, but I'll leave that for Wednesday. Hopefully people will see the importance of that. Let's turn to Matthew 17. Matthew 17, verse 1. And after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them up to a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone as the sun, his remnant was white as a light. And the poor, uh, behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elisha. So the Lord takes with him after six days. The book of Luke, the book of Mark also says this, although the book of Luke says about eight days. So it doesn't contradict itself. It just says about eight days here. It clearly says six days. He takes with him Peter, James and John. Now, these aren't necessarily his favorites, although we can look at it that way. It's just that he there's a reason for him doing this. As you know, when Jesus walked the earth, he starts with the crowds, right? We have it the reverse. We always want to start with a small group and build till we have a crowd. Jesus starts with a crowd. And then he feeds them and then he blesses them and he heals them because he's a good God. Amen? He's such a good God. 
Don't ever have the wrong heart when you see someone say they don't deserve that healing. They don't. How, how dare us ever say that? How many of us deserve healing or blessing? Nobody. So be rejoice whenever you see God's blessing on someone. Yeah. Whether you think they deserve it or not. Right. Because we get those blessings, whether we deserve it or not. So he blesses them. Then in the book of Luke 14, he begins to talk about discipleship and it thins it out. Then he begins to get to the point where he starts talking about eating and drinking of himself. And they begin to really struggle. He gets down to the 12. One of them's a traitor. He gets down to 11. He gets to the cross where everyone deserts him. Everyone. Because we all have to come to that place, don't we? I'll never desert you, Lord. I'm your man. I'm your woman. And we found out, wow, I can fall just like Peter. Amen. He gets to where there's no, not one. Then he's resurrected. He has the, his, he has his suffering and his death and resurrection. And he has 120. And then he gets the multitudes on the, on the. So for everybody's wondering how you build a mega church, that's how you build it. Through the cross, although I would never use that term. Yes. And so what he's doing here is he's got his 70 that he sends out into the land and they're healing. He's given them power. Can you believe that? The stupid things working. He gives them power. And then he gets down to his 12 and out of that 12, he takes three because this thing gets smaller and smaller and smaller. For the revelation. So he takes these three because he needs a remnant of a remnant of a remnant. And also because he needs in the in the in in the testimony of two or three witnesses. So he's fixing. They're fixing to witness something. He needs two or three witnesses. Now, these men he picks not because not because of their their great fortitude or their great intelligence or how faith, how how great their faith is. He picks them because because he wants to. Yeah. Same reason he picked you, because we know Peter has his issues. We know James and John's the sons of thunder wanting to call fire out of heaven. Don't re- he said at one point you don't even know what spirit you're of, but he brings them with him because he knows where he's going. Everything Jesus does is based upon the cross. Which we lose today. We say Jesus came to do good. Jesus came to do this. He came, he came to die. Everything about Jesus' life was headed for this place in time and space where he dies and everything changes. Amen? Mm-hmm. Everything. Everything Jesus did is predicated by what does the Father want? That everything would be held together in him. Amen? He's headed somewhere. Everything he does. So he knows what he's doing even now. So he takes these and he takes them to a high mountain. Apart. He takes them to a high mountain apart, not just a mountain, but a high mountain. Now, we live in Texas. Well, we live in the Gulf Coast. Texas actually have mountains. So we live at sea level or below. Right. That's why it's like a steam bath in the summertime. So we really don't understand altitudes. Yeah. But when I lived overseas, we were surrounded by hills and close to mountains. And you would go, you would go, I would go walking. I loved, I loved to, to take hikes for hours at a time into the hills or mountains. And sometimes there'd be a hill, sometimes there'd be a mountain, and sometimes there'd be a high mountain. Amen? In fact, I'd promised my daughter Tabitha once that I would take her up to Cadidris, the mountain in Wales. And we were turned back twice. Was it twice, I think? I think twice. Because of snow or because of other things. But we finally made it up there to the high mountain. Yeah. So sometimes God wants to take us up to the high mountain. and We can't get discouraged. We can't get weary. Amen. As I've often said, there's times when I've been on walks on our climbs and I thought, there's the precipice. Oh, I've made it. I'm getting a little tired. I've made it. And when I cross that little knoll, then it goes up another 200 feet. I think, wow. This is higher than I thought. So he takes him to a high mountain. Jesus often went away to mountains. Whenever the crowds, especially, have you ever thought about that? When the crowds pressed in and wanted to make him king or after tremendous miracles, where did Jesus go? He didn't go on the radio to brag. He didn't get his face put on the, the, the cover of some Christian magazine. No, what he did is 
He took off for the hills. He took off for the mountains to get with his God. Father, what do you want? He was very, very protective of what his father wanted. This is why so many times, even when he heals someone, he'd say, don't tell everybody, anybody. Because it's not my time. Timing was so important. So he goes to a high mountain apart. In other words, when there comes a time for you to see Jesus, where it comes a time for you to really, really get a hold of God, you've got to go to that high mountain. You've got to go apart. Now, God doesn't want us living apart. He doesn't want us to live separate from people. He wants us in the world, but not of it. But how many of you know there's times you've got to be apart? There's times you've got to get a hold of the Lord. There's times you've got to close yourself off. It's hard to do today. Our phones won't stop. Things all around us go all the time. We don't know what it is to just be so silent, turn everything off and get with the Lord. I'm so grateful that I had so many times that, that, of being able to do that. Of course, at the time, I wasn't always grateful. There's times I walked in the hills, times I was lost for hours and hours and think, Lord, Lord, what are you doing with me? Why aren't you using me? Here I am just, just stuck up on some mountain. What are you doing? But now I'm so grateful that I've had that time. I don't run into very many men that have that time. I run into men who who they start off in ministry. They get their schooling or whatever. Then then they're active and they're busy and they're busy and they're busy the whole time. Busyness keeps them going. But there's got to be a time where he says, come with me to a high place apart. So they go with him to a high place apart. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his remnant was white as light. This is amazing. The Son of God, all of a sudden, he's transformed. Heaven and earth are touching each other, and you're seeing the, the glimpses of the glorification of Christ. He's, he's pulling, pulling back, or, or they're coming to him. I don't know how it works, but, a, but a, a realm has been breached, and all of a sudden, they're seeing something of the other realm. Show me a man who's seen something of the other realm, and I'll show you a man who's completely different. Show me a sister who's really seen something of that other realm, and I'll show you a sister who understands that Mary ministry. Not the Martha ministry. All of a sudden, they're there, and he's transfigured in front of them. And he begins to, to exemplify what we see in the book of Revelation. There's glory all over him. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elisha talking with him. In other words, Peter, James, and John, they're given privy to something of the other side. How many, how many of you know that doesn't happen a lot? But every once in a while it'll happen. It happened on the, on the road to Damascus with Paul. When he says, I saw the Lord, I don't know what he saw, but definitely that light shone upon him. He had a revelation of who Christ was. It doesn't happen a lot, but it, 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 every once in a while you get that break in that. And it's what takes you forward. This is what we need today. As I've said again and again, I'll say it again. We need men who see. We need men who see. To quote T. Austin Sparks, it's all about conception, not imitation. We have imitation everywhere where, where one man sees something of God and then everybody imitates it. He tells one man, do this, and then churches replicate it all over the place. And then those men are stuck with keeping something going, keeping it 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 going. But we need, what we need is conception. Will you receive something from the Lord? Lord, Frank, all I know is he touched me a few weeks back and just showed me his grace. Run with that. It's real to you. Amen. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And all of a sudden, Moses and Elisha are talking with him. And it says in one place, they're talking about his demise. They're talking about what's coming. This is what's, this is what's on the mind of heaven. This is what's on the lips of the sanctified saints that have gone there. This is what Elijah and Moses are concerned with. They're talking to him about what's coming. I don't know what was in the conversation, but it must have been amazing. They're talking about what's going to happen. Because everything has to do with the cross. And these disciples can't see it. 
We're too intelligent for our own good today. Oh, let's go. Let's go past just the cross. Let's go past the blood of Jesus. Let's go past just that that salvation. Let's go past that you can do nothing with Christ. Let's go and do other things. No, this, the glorification of Jesus is everything. And they're talking about it. And why these men? I don't know. But I do find it interesting that Elisha didn't die. The chariot came down and took him bodily into heaven. We know by the in the New Testament, the book of Jude, that Satan argued over the body of Moses. Where is it? We don't know. But these two, these two, who we don't have their burial place, they're talking. They're talking to Jesus. How amazing is that? Can you matter, Peter, James, and John? At one point, they said they had fallen asleep. Why did they fall asleep? Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Is the flesh not weak? The flesh is so weak. I know I'll get in trouble with this, but I have to smile when we hear what's going on and, and war is coming and all. And let me tell you, this thing is going to spread. Yeah. And all this is coming. And Christians are like, we we want to hear a sermon about being willing to die for Jesus. Like, come on, you you go to you go to this late service because you can't even get out of bed. So these guys, their spirit is willing, but their flesh is weak. Yeah. Because that's what happened when they were praying with with Jesus in the garden. Yeah. There's no sense getting upset at you about that. I mean, how many of you make up your mind? I'm going to pray and then you fall asleep. I do. Times like, Lord, I'm going to sit here and pray and then I fall asleep. Don't beat yourself up of it. But just say, Lord, I have to I have to get my flesh in order. Think about it. Do you know what it talks to Ben? It talks about meditating on the word. Think about it. Have you ever watched? Watch people. You go into the restaurant, there's a family, there's a mother and father and three kids. They're all on their devices. It's, you feel like going up and hitting the father in the head. Bonk, bonk, bonk. Do you know who these people are? They're your children. Talk to them. Yeah, this is not this is not to sit here and have have a rant about technology. Technology is part of everybody's life in so many ways. But we have to have discipline. Go into a store and watch people get in a line or watch something stop people for two seconds. Their phone's out immediately. I don't have that much attention span. Now, you know, I never had much of an attention span. My poor mother, Sister Mary Hatchett, Sister Not of Mercy and all them, they were always mad at me. But I tell you, when I came to Christ, I would practice his presence, as Brother Andrew said. And I would say, Lord, let me learn what it is to sit in your presence and be still. If I can't be still, let me walk back and forth. Let me think about you, Jesus. Let me worship you. Yeah. There's a nervous energy. This is why what what we're trying to do is difficult. I'm going to be honest, because it's like sometimes I feel like, Lord, you know, you need to offer all this stuff to people so that they'll come. They'll, to, they'll come to meetings. They'll, they'll give. They're just, I'm not going to do it. This, you will see by the end of this message, I hope and pray by the Holy Spirit. You will see this is what we're going to do. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So imagine these guys, they begin to wake up and they're like, oh, my gosh. They're watching something supernatural unfold. So Elijah And Moses are talking to him. Right. Then answered Peter and said, Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you will, let us make for thee a tabernacle, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. Because he didn't know what he was saying. He didn't know what else to say. And we know Peter, he speaks without thinking at times. It's okay. God's going to use him to speak some of the best messages ever. Amen. So he looks up, he doesn't know what to say, but he's still earthbound. Even though he's having visions, he's earthbound. All he can think of is, let, let, let's build some temples. Let's make something right here. What did we see last week when we were reading the book of Hosea? Behold, it says Israel has forgotten their maker and builds temples. When men, when men begin to lose Jesus, they just begin to build. Once again, thank the Lord we're in a rented building. Thank the Lord we have air conditioning in Texas. Thank the Lord for everything we have, but we don't need much of it, do we? Because they get earthbound. So Peter just speaks out, Lord, let's build a temple, one for you, one for, because he doesn't understand what's going on. He doesn't understand that everything's headed for a certain place with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And while he spake, a bright cloud overshadowed him. Behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Everything, everything points to Jesus. It's got to be, today it's got to be Jesus and. Jesus and, we're going to give you lots of reasons to serve God. No, and it's not being harsh. Please understand me. It's not like, it's not like, it's Jesus, what's wrong with you? But it's like, this, this is the whole point is the glorification of Jesus. This is the answer. You have a problem this morning. Your answer is Jesus. How many times I've sat with people and said, listen, I don't have all the answers, but I know the answer is Jesus. And yet they get mad at me. Come on, give me more. What more do you want? Now, God can speak. God can speak by by a word of of knowledge or whatever. He can touch this. He can touch that. But at the end of the day, it's all taken care of in Jesus. Amen. I remember years ago being in my bus, my 35 foot bus we traveled in. It was named Gomer. I think that should explain everything to you about how the bus treated me and I treated the bus. But I'm there all by myself. It, you know, alone. Our tent meeting is out out there. It's over. And I'm struggling with a particular brother. But I come to the truth about it. Lord, this is where my heart's really at. I got honest, which is what we need to do. And I felt like I was holding it now. Boy, this is ugly. And I said, Lord, what do I do with this? And the Lord said, give it to me. And I pulled back. I was a young believer. I thought, Lord, this is this is filthy, right? My heart is angry at this brother. This is this is this is terrible. What do you mean give it to you? And he said, give it to me and I'll put it on the cross where it belongs. This is where everything goes. And I had victory that night. And I had victory that night. The answer is Jesus. Every time the church fails, every time there's a difficulty, he brings Jesus into view. Amen. Even in the last move of God, people talked about the gifts of the Spirit and all that went on. But I want to assure you of something. It didn't start off that way. It started off with people discovering Jesus again. And that's all they could talk about. How convicted I've been when I just talked to people about the Lord or this or that and just got to tell them I fell in love with Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So Moses and Elijah are there. Peter says, I need to build you each a temple. He thinks right away, this is man's way of thinking, where we are today. I need to do something. What can I do? There's nothing you can do. And it's almost as if Peter is interrupted. This cloud comes over, which God has spoken so many times out of the cloud. It's still Old Testament. He's still speaking out of the clouds, not speaking out of them now. And he comes and it's the voice of God. It's not thunder. It's not lightning like with Elijah. It's not rumbling. It's a still small voice. And what does that still small voice say? This is the love of God speaking. And Peter's right in the middle of it. We'll do this. We'll do this. And as if this cloud comes in and says, quiet. You ever been there? Anybody ever been in prayer? You're complaining or you're praying or you're trying to figure it out. All of a sudden, the presence of the Lord is there and you realize it's time to be quiet. Then God speaks and says, this is my son. Hear ye. This is not this is not what we started off in the book of Hebrews and our brother shared with us, was it not? When we started off weeks ago in the past and through sundry times, God spoke through the prophets and the law. But now he speaks through what? His son, Jesus. We need to get back to Jesus. You look at things in the natural and spiritual. In the natural, we see what's going on in the Middle East. And yet many people are realizing that the enemy is all in our country. We've opened the borders, the borders, and our enemy is among us. But even in much of Christianity, our enemy is among us. Liberalism, feminism, humanism, psychiatry, all these isms have infiltrated the church. Because we've got to get back to Jesus. And when I'm saying that, I'm not just using a name. I'm not using just, just a script. Because I know people will be like, but brother, people are hurting. I know they're hurting. I've lived my life. I've devoted my life to what God wants to do. I've sat with many people. And God concerns about your hurts. And God knows them. It's not just to put them away. But at the end of the day, you've got to know Jesus. It's got to be you.
Maybe it's he's going to speak to you through this word. Maybe through you're, through you're sitting with someone in counseling or whatever it is, but it'll always be Jesus. So all of a sudden, this cloud comes and it almost interrupts Peter. Peter's like, what are we going to do? What is this? Now, don't be mad at him because that's where we're at. Is that not right? I need to do something. And it shows Shadow says, quiet. Now, it doesn't say that, so I'm not going to get in trouble here with the scriptures. But the crowd of the cloud of Shadow says, This is my beloved son. Like this is him. This is the one I love. Now I'm telling you, I'm going to say this again. The world, because humanism so come in struggles with that. It struggles with it. We live in a society. Satan has taken great pains to say everybody's equal. How many of you know everybody's not equal? Are we all equal that we're all sinners? Yes. Are we all equal that we can find Christ? Yes. And when we find him, and when we find him, do we all have the same inheritance? Yes. But some folks are smarter than others. Some are taller than others. Some are browner than others. Some are whiter than others. Some are loud. Some are quiet. People are not all equal. Even with Jesus in the example, did Jesus love these brothers more than he loved the other ones? I don't believe that. I believe I believe he had a special purpose for them being on that hill. And maybe they were his favorites for a reason. But it didn't mean he didn't love these others. And what we struggle with today, the world does is this and Satan does. God loves Jesus. That's his beloved son. That's who he loves. And he's decided that everything is going to be in him. Do you understand that? Jesus was not king of kings and lord of lords. He was never given that title till he was resurrected. But the father's plan was everything is going to be in my son. These folks, Adam and Eve, the human race, they've sinned. They've made a mistake. They can't find their way back. Now, he could have destroyed the earth and started over. And he will destroy this earth and start over. But only after he's brought salvation to those who want it. Amen? Yes? So he could have done that. But what he did is he said, I'm going to take my son. Everything's going to be on him because I love him and he loves me and he's going to do everything I want. This whole thing's between the father and the son. But people are like, not fair. How could it? It's not supposed to be fair. It's just. And here's our joy and our rejoicing is that our God. Who loves his son and everything's in his son. Because of his son, because he is a God of of love, doesn't have love. He is love. Because of what he does with his son, every one of us can share in the love he has for his son. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? The love he has for his son is the love he has for Rachel and for CJ, and for Frankie. And for Lee. It's amazing. It's amazing. But we're so, so convinced today that we've got to make everybody feel good. And maybe we don't want anybody to feel bad. That's why I'm telling you, even even what's going on in Israel. People are shocked, but do not be deceived on the hatred of Israel. It will come up. And why? Because God chose them. Not fair. Why did God choose them and not the Italians? Okay, He chose the Italians to have nice clothes and to be some good, handsome young men. But he didn't choose them. That's just a fact. Does that bother you? It doesn't bother me. Well, God chose the Jews. He didn't he didn't choose any race but them. But I'm a Jew spiritually now. So I get to partake. Do you see? I'm hoping you can see how that's creeped in so much to our thinking. And that's why the gospel has so much going on and we lose Jesus. And it grieves me to say those words. So Peter's talking. I love Peter, don't you? And these brothers, because they're not trying to be religious. He just he's just being himself. He just talks out of turn. Let's make a let's do this. And the cloud comes. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. It's the same thing it said when John the Baptist. So I'm cut him out of the water. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and they were afraid. They heard the voice of God. Amen. You really hear the voice of God. It'll stagger you. Amen. I'm always suspect of people who write books. I went to heaven. I had this vision. I have this vision. I'm going to write this best-selling book. And then this is cool. And God, everything's cool. It's like, I don't think so. Paul said, Paul had visions above visions caught up in heaven. And what did he say? Words I cannot utter. Man, he missed an opportunity to make a lot of money writing a book about what he saw in heaven. He wouldn't have dared done it. 
He wouldn't have dared done it. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their face. They were afraid. Now get the picture. Can you get the picture? So they go up with Jesus. What are we going to do? Jesus, we're going to pray or something? And so it's like, well, Jesus is always praying so long they fall asleep. And all of a sudden, they're waking up. And it's like Jesus is transformed in front of them. They're seeing something they will never forget. Watch this, people. These three men saw something, did they not? Peter speaks about it. Peter speaks about it. It says, for we receive from God, the God, the Father, honor and glory when there came a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son and I'm well pleased. And this voice came from heaven and we heard it and we were with him in the holy mount. For we also have a more sure word of prophecy. You want to understand Peter? When you read first Peter and second Peter, keep this in your mind. This man saw Jesus glorified. He saw something. That's how he preaches like this. We don't need men who say, I learned something. We need men who say, I saw something. God showed me his glory. God showed me his love. God showed me. And I'm not just talking about having a supernatural vision. It can be within your heart. And this is not to exclude people. And it's definitely not to discourage you like, like I've got to see this. It's to, it's to give you faith and hope to say, God, show me. Amen. Show me. What does John say in first John? John says the word that we held and we saw. You go read first John, second John and third John. You're not reading about men that said I spent a life studying. You're reading about men who saw something and you can't unsee something, people. You can't unsee it. It's revelation. So they see it. They see Elijah. And they see Moses. And then that's not enough. Then God speaks and they fall down on the ground. Have you ever seen that so much? Real worship. If God really shows up in many of our assemblies, it's not the loudness of our singing or the dancing. It's how many are on their knees. They're flat, they're flat on the ground. And the next thing, Jesus come and touches him. Why? This is his ministry, people. Is he not the glorified Christ? He's talking to Moses and Elijah. One minute he's talking to Moses and Elijah. He's dealing with kingdom business. He's transfigured. The next moment in his human form, he's touching them on the shoulder. Somebody say amen. How many times when you read the word of God, and you see in the word how beautiful it is, how excellent it is, how amazing it is. It seems so beyond you. You say, God, I need you. And then you feel his touch. Then you realize he came on this earth with us. What more can God do? Amen. Why didn't Jesus just stay? Why didn't Jesus just just back step back into the glory he had known? Do you understand the humility of Christ? We don't understand that humility. People curse his name. They say he's unfair. They say all this. We don't understand the humility to say, I'm going to step back into this. Dust on my feet. Thirsty. Having to eat and walk like other men. Feeling the sun beat down upon me. Away from my father, except by the connected of the spirit. Oh, people. People, this is so exciting. Do you understand what I'm saying, where we're going? See, it's like, no, Frank, we have to do all this other stuff. People, people won't show up. They want, I, I, I don't know another thing but to present you Jesus. When I was a little boy when in Fifth Ward, which sounds strange for a white boy to say that, but my dad's store was there and we weren't Christians at the time. My dad didn't come to Christ till his, in his 50s. But if you drive down the street, the poor black preachers would always put a big microphone outside their building. And even one of the preachers used to come on the on, on Friday night and stand outside our store and preach. And I'm sure people mocked them and thought, yeah, crazy old man and poor folks. But those men were preaching the heart of God. Ignorant and unlearned men by the world. But they'd seen something. And in their poverty, they were making many rich. 
And you could hear him singing for blocks. But the world's got in now. And now gospel music has become taken over by the world. Where awards and money is what it's all about. Shouldn't say it, Frank. I'm sorry. Somebody has to say it. They fell on their feet. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. Is this is not what's said to Daniel. Is this is not what's said to everyone that finds themselves on the ground in the presence of God. What does he tell them? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And when they lifted their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Somebody say amen. That's a message right there. That is the message. When they lifted their eyes, they saw Jesus. Moses isn't there. Why? Because first of all, Moses and Elijah, as great as they were, as fantastic as they were, they weren't, they weren't completely competent men, were they? Moses spoke out of turn and was angry. Elisha, it says, was a man of like passions. They weren't perfect. But they were in heaven. Amen. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But I'm going to be there. You're going to be there. Amen. When we're glorified. They weren't perfect. But also, what did they represent? Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophets. How important they are. But yet, but yet. It's all Jesus. Amen. Jesus. Jesus. We have to see him again. We have to see him again. Men's hearts are going to start failing them for fear. People are going to be struggling, shook up, and that that needle is going to move back some. But we need to be standing along with all those believers out there who love Jesus, who are saying, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Yeah. How many of you know you can be a good person? How many know you can be a religious person? How many know you can read the Bible? You can go to church and not know Jesus. Amen. So often talk test the testimony of a precious grandma. You know, when I got saved and would say, tell people Christ to save me, even if they didn't want to listen to me, they at least thought, well, he needed say he needed something. That boy needed some help. But boy, when my mother never said a bad word, went to church. Sweetest lady you ever had. When she started telling people, I need Jesus. She told me once years ago, she said, you know, for everything that went on, one thing I knew. I would go to hell till I met him. See, we did do service by looking at people saying, oh, they know God. Don't 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 make such a stand. They're going to church. They know God. It's OK. And it's not for us to go and judge every man's heart because we can't do that. and We're not supposed to. But it's to hold up Jesus. So maybe someone's really met the Lord and they need to see him afresh. Hold up Jesus. Maybe they've been going to church and haven't really met him. Hold up Jesus. As I said, I've used it before that John Wesley in the Church of Church of England. He even traveled to to the to was it the Carolines or Georgia in, in 1770 or whatever it was. He was a missionary to the Indians and he didn't know. Jesus. They looked up and they saw. Jesus. They saw Jesus. These men couldn't do it. These men couldn't do it. As great as Elijah and him was. What does 2 Corinthians 5.16 says? Therefore, know no man after the flesh, though you have known Christ after the flesh, but yet we know him no more. Think about that. Know no man after the flesh. Yeah, you're struggling with some other believer. I don't believe the way they do. I'm judging this or that about them. Listen, do they know Christ? Then don't know him after the flesh. Know that Christ lives inside of them. Build your relationship on that. Pray for them according to that way and watch how it happens. But have you thought about these words that Paul's writing? We've known him in the flesh. In other words, think about James and John and Peter. They knew him in the flesh. They knew how his clothes smelt. They knew what it was like to be close to him. They knew the touch of his hand. And yet they had such a revelation after the resurrection. They knew this is not the Christ anymore. When we talk of Jesus, I don't want to go back and and have a movie or a play or something. Try to portray his life on the earth. I don't need that because that's not the Jesus I'm worshiping. The Jesus I'm worshiping is the one in the book of Revelation. 
It's not that Jesus, he's meek and mild, he's a nice guy, and he wants to make you feel better. It's like, no, let me tell you my Jesus. I can only tell you by what I know by revelation. I can only tell you by the words that hear that are, that are uh, alive and alight. My Jesus. His hair is like wool. He shines like the sun. He's a glorified man. He's a man, flesh and bone, but he's glorified. He's perfect. He didn't, he didn't just eat from the tree of life. He is the tree of life. Can you see how, how the people aren't ready for that? They're like, no, I need more. I want to hold on to something. I want, I want this. I want that. I want, I want something else. I want, it's like Jesus is enough. Amen? And this is to encourage you this morning. That you can have that walk with him. Because that's what he wants. We live in a time where people are, are grading things like this person's a good Christian, that person's a great, that pastor's a great man. All that goes away when you see Jesus because it's like, no. No, he that's in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. Maybe somebody knows him for three weeks. They have Jesus. They've known him all their life. They have Jesus. Maybe the worst backslider begins to turn. At that moment, there's no, there's no caring about where you've been, what your sins have been. You know Jesus. It's all over because he takes care of everything. Amen. Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he have preeminence. In everything, what is it? Jesus. What is Jesus? What does he want in my life? Amen. What does he want in my life? You can know him. Please receive this in the spirit. It's, it's brought to you in. Not in the way of, of you've got to see Jesus and, and, and you, you come up short. It's to give you hope in saying, look, you can see him. You can know him. Amen? Don't give up. Yes, when you sit in the mornings or whatever it is and you open your word, do, do like I do. It's just, you just open it, you start reading. Maybe you don't feel anything, but in your heart you have faith. No, this is alive. This is alive. And then your eyes glance on something and Jesus speaks something to you. So real. Every time through church history, every time when there's a declension, when things are bad, would you say things are bad, people? Things are tragic. Thing, things are tragic. You keep thinking, can they get any worse? And I'm going to tell you, I've been telling you for a long time, all the stuff that we've laid out is coming due. It's coming. I'm telling you, financially, it's coming. Yeah, it's coming. Morally, it's coming. You have, you have areas of the country, 75% of all the households don't have children. What do you think that's going to look like? We're seeing what that looks like now. All that's going to come due. And what we've got to be holding up is Jesus. There'll be many churches right now that'll be planning. Look, all this is going on. We need to plan for people to come in. We need to start having more ways to get people to come in. And people may get saved, and I rejoice in that. But there's got to be a people that said, Jesus. This is the standard. Who can live up to that? Nobody but Jesus did. Amen. Keeps us all humble. Are you a good Christian? I'm not a good Christian. I'm not a bad Christian. Like a being, I am what I am. It's like a duck. Is it a good duck or a bad duck? It's a duck. Right? I'm a belief. I'm a new creation. You're a new creation. You don't judge it whether I'm a good Christian or bad Christian. You just judge it. If I le am I letting God have his life flow through me? Let me have him flow through me more and more. That in all things he has what? Preeminence. Think about that. I'm trying to move along here, but this is so important. I want you to see how the world hates this today, that he have preeminence. Jesus is it. Amen. I was talking to someone yesterday. They just brought their son from a baseball game and they were saying they got slaughtered. So on the way home, he was talking to the boy. His son got player of the year because he got hit by the ball probably. But they got slaughtered. And his dad was saying, I, I'm not going to go with this. I'm not going to sit there and say, look, everything's fine. You know, you law. He said, no. He said, I was giving him advice on how to bat better. But everybody's not a winner. See, that's where we live today. Where everything's supposed to be equal and fair. But in the human race, everything is equal to this point. 
We are all lost, amen, until we know him. And then it's all about him. And see, can you understand how the world will hate that? It's all about him. What about me? It's not about you. It's about Jesus. See, that's where you get the sons of Zadok. Are you going to minister to Jesus or are you going to minister to the people? What can The preacher has to think, what can I do this morning to make everybody feel better? Instead of saying, Jesus, identify with him. Jesus is okay this morning. Jesus loves you this morning. The Father loves Jesus. When you feel unloved, you don't need this to have us to go in front of the mirror and repeat again and again that you're a beautiful person in this. In fact, at my age and stuff, I'd get depressed looking in front of the mirror. Do you know what I'm saying? Trying to convince myself. It's like I would just know, like, who's the liar in the mirror? Here's what you need. The Father loves Jesus. Unconditionally. Without reservation. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I love Moses. I love Elijah. Here they are glorified, talking to him. But this is the one. I love him. And then all of a sudden you begin to identify with that. I'm in Jesus. That's what it means to abide in him. He saved me. That's what it means. Jesus. Such power in that. You see, when people go around shouting his name or using his name, even Christians in a vain way, it's wrong. But when you just have that name, how powerful. When Mary and I were first saved, you know, I don't want to put too this much on her, but, you know, I ran with the devil for a while. Called up things I shouldn't have done. And right after we got saved, we would go home after a meeting. And then we'd wake up in the night. There'd be presences in the room. Terror would be in the room. Satan was not happy. But I'd wake up. I didn't know the scriptures. Oh, man. I didn't know teachings, but I knew this. It's true, isn't it, Mary? I would shout. I would just cry out, Jesus. Bam. Everything would be gone. That's all I knew. Not just his name. Not just saying his name like some Christians do. Oh, my Lord, I won't even do it. I hear Christians make exclamations with his name and as if they're glorifying him. It's like you're taking his name in vain. But we knew he is that he is here. You see, I can't unsee what I've seen. That's all we knew. I didn't even have a Bible in my home. I got saved in my home. I didn't even have a Bible those first couple of weeks. But I'd leave the house. I'd close the door behind me. I'd say, Jesus, are you here? And I would feel his presence all over all upon my heart. I'd feel a love I hadn't felt. I know he's here. And then he became present in my home. Do you want your home fixed? I remember reading Oral Roberts. I know people have problems with him. Right for the wrong for I don't know. But he'd say how he's a young boy. He said he was raised in a home where Jesus was spoken. And he said Jesus was in our house. What a way to be raised. That's how I learned. How I learned to treat my wife. Not because I got a book on the love languages. I don't even know what that means. I know I'm going to get in trouble now. I don't understand what love language. I think me and my dog have the same love language. I don't know. But here's how I learned. The Holy Ghost was in our house. The Holy Ghost was in our house. And I'd feel conviction. She'd feel conviction. It's how I learned to correct my children, chasing one up the stairs. That little rascal and knowing God showing me that's the way you do me. See that little stubborn child? That's how stubborn you are. Wow. That's why I never corrected my children in anger. I'm not saying I didn't blow up at times when they poked the bear too much and shout to everybody who ran to their rooms. But I never spanked in anger. Why? Because God would always be like, that's you. That's you. You won't listen to me. I got to correct you. It's like, okay, Lord, then help me correct this child in the right way. Jesus, we've got to see Jesus. In Luke 16, 16, it says the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom is preached and every man presses into it. All they had was the law and the prophets. What a beautiful 
That's what this is, ain't it? Not beautiful because you've got this silly preacher up here, but because just to see it, that Moses and Elijah, do you know to the Jews how important that was? Everything hung on the law and the prophets. And God was making it clear, this is my son. Hear ye him. That's what we saw in the book of Hebrews. Don't let your heart get hard. Hear him. Can you hear him this morning? If you can hear him, you can hear him in a song. You can hear him in a message. You can know this is Jesus is telling you. But see, so much of that humanism is bled in where everybody wants to feel good and everybody wants to be equal and everybody wants to be nice and everybody, everything instead of saying Jesus. Jesus. Then to do your heart good. Amen. You're going to have the most famous preacher up there preaching and people hanging on his every word. And you can have some poor widow sister on her knees at home in her corner or closet saying, Jesus, be with me and the glory of God be all around. Her. Isn't it beautiful? He's for every one of you. No matter what you're struggling with. No matter what sin, what difficulties you have, do not pull away from your God. Draw near to Him. You saw it here. Jesus, Peter didn't even get rebuked. He just got silenced. This is my son and my mom. And then Jesus come and touches him and says, don't be afraid. They got a glimpse of what's coming. That's what we get. When we're in worship. Or we're singing to the Lord or you're in prayer, whatever it is, you, you touch that glory. How many of you touch it just for a moment? You're like, oh, it's so beautiful. We can't live in that all the time. Why? Because we're in time and space. We have a job to do. Amen. We have to we have to complete the sufferings of Christ just as he walked the earth. Yeah. Now, we're not like him. We weren't God walking the earth, but we have God and we're walking the earth. Sometimes do you ever get weary like, Lord, it's a weary journey. I long, I long for that. Amen. Now you see, Christians don't long for it as much because we've done everything we could to make Christianity down here as comfortable and as beautiful as possible. But there was a time where people would long. I remember when we first got saved, they were talking about Christ coming back so much. Why? Because so many people were in love with Jesus. And there was so much talk about, I wish he'd come back today. But we don't talk about that because we're in the end times. We talk about the end times. We talk about all the geography and the historical facts. But we don't look at the church and say, don't you wish he was coming today? Don't you miss him? Don't you want to step off from all this into glory? A glimpse of it. Not where there's just little fat naked babies floating around. But where, where you're brought in. Can you imagine Moses and Elijah? They're talking about his, his demise. They're having a discussion about what's going on. They're a part of the heavenly, the heavenly function. Thy will be done. Let your kingdom come. That's what you're a part of. Amen. Heaven going forward. Heaven's going forward here. When Frankie gets up and shares about Oscar, this, this poor preacher and ignored. Who cares? Heaven is going forward. Amen. Heaven is going forward. I long for those days for the people to come in, for young families to come in and say, and the father to say, we want Jesus. This might not be the best place, and we know it's not. We know we all have our issues, but I want Jesus. That's all I need. I want to be challenged about Jesus. Say, Frank. That's a big ask. I'm not going to I'm not going to move from it. Why? Because I'm a good guy. No. Why? Because of what I've seen. Because of what I've seen. I've seen the church function. I've got a glimpse of it. I get a glimpse of it here. Amen. Do you understand now when we say Jesus is the answer? 
Doesn't mean we won't talk with you. Doesn't mean we won't cry with you. Doesn't mean we won't believe for the Spirit to reveal what this problem or that problem is. Of course we will. Doesn't mean God is unconcerned with your hurts. He's very concerned with them. But he's concerned with them to the point that you be free. Amen. As Larry Crabb said in his book, Inside Out, he said either our pain is all that matters and all we're consumed about, or we go the other side and our pain doesn't matter at all. We just go through life with it. But he said the right attitude is, Lord, I have this pain and I need it out of the way so I can follow you better. Amen? God is in, in concerned. Don't get us wrong. That's why we have this message here. So when you and I look at people and say, the answer is Jesus, we're not just taking a Christian cliche and throwing it at somebody. We're telling them he is the answer. As the Puritan preacher said, Jesus Christ does not answer, uh, fix problems. They're lost in his vastness. I've got problems this morning. I've got things we're carrying. Children that we're praying for, children that with medical needs. And like Paul said, on top of all that, the burdens of the church is daily on the inside. And sometimes I'm surprised when I want to sit. And I want to just list the things out to the Lord that I find myself having a joy. Wanting to dance inside my, my uh, apartment outside. Yes? It's like, what's going on? Jesus, he's there. Glory to God. It's all I ever wanted. It's all I ever wanted. When I got saved all those years ago, I wasn't looking for an answer for my problems. I wasn't looking for the answer for my pain. I wasn't looking for an answer for drugs. I was, well, I, was, I was looking for the answer. I wanted the answer. I just wanted to know what is the truth of all this. And Christ revealed himself. Let us pray this morning for everyone you're praying for. Every child that's away. Every spouse that's away. Every neighbor you're praying for. The nation that God revealed himself in them. Not just to them. Preachers are exhausting themselves. I talk to them all the time. They're exhausted. People are using every, every device they can to try to show God to people. And it's wrong. We need to pray, God, reveal yourself in them. And you say, how can we do that? You got it right. You cannot do it. Do you see the need for prayer? Oh, thank God. I don't understand prayer. It's a mystery. We need to pray even though he knows all the answers. But I know one thing. Prayer puts everything in the right perspective. I cannot do it, but you can do it. This is why we had those messages. I promise I will close after this. But the message is about Job, did we not? What did Job say? I heard you with the hearing of my eyes and I see you. See, we're not bold enough to preach those messages because Job is hurting so bad. We've got to do something. We've got to alleviate that pain. God takes care of it. God says, who's darkening my door? Who's darkening my door? Who, who, who? Then Job says, I know God can do anything. People, that's a man who believes he can do anything. Amen. I've had real tragedies, you know that. I've stood at grave sites, I've buried children. Anthony, two people in this room have been through tragedies. And you know what surprises me? My God can do anything. How do you, what do you mean? It's not because God can do anything because I've heard a testimony or I've been taught this. He can do anything because I saw his omnipotent power. Job said those words before, before he and his wife had 11 children. And I have to correct something very quick this morning. Job did not look at his wife and said, don't be a foolish woman. We had nothing, brought nothing in the world, we'll take nothing. He said, don't be as those foolish women. So I must correct that. That word, that as is very important. She wasn't a foolish woman. He was just saying, don't be as one. Yep. How do you know that? I tell you what, they must have fell all in love all again. She didn't look at him and say, no. I'm not going through that again. I've already had 11 pregnancies. I've buried 11 children. No, she had 11 more kids. Amazing. And then the other night when the brothers were together, we were encouraged when Jeremiah says, God, look at all the wickedness in the world. Pull them up by the roots. I can't take anymore. And God doesn't say, it's okay. You get the reward for being a great prophet. He says, listen, if you've run with the footmen, how are you going to run with the horses? Because God knows. That he can do it. Those who suffer the most sometimes have the most revelations. Amen. Do you want revelations for the Lord? It does cost. 
It does cost brothers and sisters. Paul, who had an abundance of trouble, had an abundance of revelations. Amen. Yeah. So all this talk of victory, 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 victory. Sometimes it's in our losses in what seems like defeats is where we see that. God wants revelation. It costs. Amen. Some of you have watched you. I've watched your struggles and I've watched your I've watched your difficulties, but I've also watched this. I've watched a wine press. Yeah. You know, you press that wine. And it comes out sweet. You press that olive oil and it comes out sweet. And I'm watching stuff come from you. When I hear some of you brothers pray, when I watch some of you sisters, I know, Lord, that press has been tough. But God's bringing it out. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear ye him. Hear him. When you look up from your fear, when you look up, you will only see Jesus. Amen. And is that enough? He's enough. He's more than enough. He can do anything. He can do everything. Amen. That's seeing. Job said, I've heard you at the hearing mirrors now. I see you. Doesn't say he had any visions, but all of a sudden he saw who God really was. He's not just the blesser. He's not just the one who corrects like his friends. Do. He's not just the one that does this. He's God. And you know what God does? Whatever he wants. Yeah. But he's a loving father. Amen. Amen. Do you trust him? Do you trust him this morning? Put your hand in his hand and said, Jesus, I'm looking to you. This is what we're going to do. We're going forward with this, Jesus. And as the life flows, we will have to make changes. We might have to do this, or add this, or do that. But it'll all be on this ground, Jesus. Don't you want Jesus? I want something for my kids, something for my wife. I want to be entertained. This is not the place for you. Jesus. Amen. Jesus, start here. I'm telling you, those of you who are burdened this morning, your burdens will lift just simply with this. It's just Jesus, Frank? That's right. You mean all I have to do is love him? Yes. What about all this other stuff? Just love him. He'll take care of it. He'll take care of you. What a freedom. What a freedom. Yeah? Release your burdens this morning. They're not yours. They're his. Jesus. I should bring you joy this morning. Wow. That's all it is, Frank. That's all it is. Father loves Jesus. And I'm a recipient of that. Glory to God. Let's pray. Please release those burdens to the Lord. Pre, please look up and see Jesus. Amen. See him. He may give you a, a Mystical experience, or it may just be by faith. I see you, Jesus. I see you. He loves you. Amen. He loves you. He's forever resurrected. Anthony, you want to stand and pray for us? I, I'm, I'm completely done here. I can't even pray.